Hey everyone, and welcome to the next part in my Ghosts of Ghostbusters Explained series. Today, we will be looking at every entity seen in Ghostbusters the video game and explain their classifications, origins, abilities, and story if they have it. Also, if you haven't seen the last one, let me just take a clip from that video to explain the Ghostbusters CDI system. But before we begin, I should start by explaining the Classification, Description, and Identification System, or CDI system. There are seven classes of ghosts. Class 1s are undeveloped forms and often hard to see or interact with. These include spectral lights and disembodied voices. Class 2s actually have somewhat of a form and can physically manipulate things in our world. These include things like floating bedsheets and ghostly hands. Class 3s and 4s are pretty similar. Class 3s are ghosts with a distinct human form and personality, however if their pre-death identity is discovered then they are automatically reassigned to Class 4. Class 5s are ectoplasmic manifestations with a non-human form. This includes the Slimers and other more monstrous ghosts. Class sixes are entities with a physical body. These are often less intelligent and more animalistic compared to other ghosts. And finally, we have class sevens, which are your gods, demons, and other extremely powerful entities. Also, just to clarify, the CDI system is somewhat inconsistent throughout the franchise, and to stay consistent with my last video, I will be using the RPG CDI system as a guideline as that's what most people think is the best. However, that means that some classifications given in the game might not match up to what they would have been classified as in the RPG. But without further ado, let's get started. The first Ghostbusters the video game exclusive ghost we meet is the Sloth Ghost. He is a class 5, free roaming, full torsoed ghost. So this guy was once a man named Arbison Morguncher, who in 1937 committed suicide by eating a Thanksgiving feast intended for 12 people all by himself. Now, usually a ghost like him would actually fall under class 4, however due to the nature of his death, he became somewhat of a paragon of gluttony and reformed as a deformed entity summoned by raw psychokinetic energy. This means that all connections to his previous life have been completely severed and he has no memory of any of it, thus making him a class 5. Next up is the bellhop ghosts found in the Cedric Hotel. They are class 3, full torsoed anchored animating ghosts. So the reason there's an unusual amount of these guys is due to the dark history of the Sedgwick. The Sedgwick Hotel is one of the many buildings in New York that was built by the top gozer worshipper Evo Shandor. This place was used for many rituals and experiments, and if you watched my previous video, you know that one of those resulted in the creation of Slimer. But anyway, over the decades, there have been a ton of mysterious bellhop disappearances and accidents that were mostly covered up by the hotel executives. And all those missing people who disappeared are the ones you fight in the game. The next entity up is the Candelabrum Crawler. These guys are class 2 corporeal swarmers. They are light fixtures possessed by mischievous little spirits who are controlled by some animal life force that once existed in our world. Now, this doesn't mean that they were once some four-legged animal. The creatures that possess these crawlers are the embodied essence of those animals' nature and instincts. I know, confusing, right? Don't worry, I'll talk a bit more about what possesses them a bit later. Next, we have the dead fish flyers who fly around Pappy Sargassi. They are Class 2 Swarmers. An interesting thing to note about them is that they actually originate from the ghost world, so presumably they are ghost world fish that Sargassi caught post-death and not before. And next up we have the Kitchen Golem. He is a Class 6 Composite Unstable Attractor. This golem is a collection of kitchen supplies given life by Pappy Sargassi. Now, Sargassi isn't possessing these supplies, he's actually giving him a huge amount of psychokinetic energy. However, that power comes with the drawback in that it makes this entity extremely unstable and easy to destroy. And to cap off the ghosts found in the Welcome to Hotel Cedric level, we have the angry fisherman himself, Pappy Sargassi. He is a Class 4 Animating Floater. When he was alive, he was part of a family supposedly cursed with extremely bad luck. Every generation of his family were either sailors or fishermen, however all of them somehow ended up dying in a water-related accident. This gave Sargassi a rightfully earned fear of water. So instead of becoming a sailor or fisherman, he opened up his own seafood restaurant. And the restaurant actually became extremely successful, to the point that he was able to start franchises in prestigious locations such as the Cedric Hotel. This led Sargassi to believe that he was no longer cursed and he finally took up fishing. However, while having lunch on his fishing boat, he would end up dying from choking on a fish stick and being eaten by a great white shark. Now, let's start with the entities from the Panic from Times Square level. To start, we have the Marshmallow Minis spawned by Stay Puffed. They are Class 6 Manifesting Caustic Swarmers. So, these guys are kinda strange, which is saying something in the Ghostbusters universe. They are their own sentient entity, however they are also a part of a hive mind controlled by Gozer as Stay Puffed. I'll also add in another variation of these guys right here. I'm pretty sure they don't have an official name, so I'll call them the Mini Marshmallow Minis. 
They should be the same classification as the regular ones, but the only difference seems to be that they are severely underdeveloped and are just used for a quick attack. Next up are the Hobo Ghosts. They are class 3, full torso, free roaming ghosts. Not much to really say about these guys, there are a bunch of homeless people in New York who have met an unfortunate demise. And these guys were the ones who were so angry at society that they decided to come back with a vengeance. After that, we have the Shandorian Stone Gargoyles that can be found at the Sedgwick and Shandor Island. These are Class 6 Caustic Floaters. So, like I said, these guys were built by Shandor's Cult of Gozer, and they are then taken over by powerful animator ghosts. Next up is the Construction Worker Ghost. They are Class 3, free-roaming, full-torsoed animating ghosts. These ghosts are the result of countless workplace accidents all over New York. Guess they didn't follow the OSHA guidelines enough. And to cap off the ghosts for this level, we have the Opera Singers. They are Class 4, full torso free-roaming ghosts. Now, they're Class 4 because we know exactly which play they were a part of. During the Broadway play Ring, the outdated stage there collapsed and the entire cast was killed. Now, to start talking about the entities found in the library level. First, let's talk about Crusher and Cresto. They are both Class 5, full-roaming, telekinetic, animating vapors. They also happen to be your standard Ghost World ghosts. They presumably got into our world through the Ghost World portal found in the basement of the library. Next, let's talk about the Book Golem. It is a Class 6, composite, unstable attractor. Just your standard Golem enemy. These ones are given life by those Class 5s I just talked about. Not much to say other than that. Next up are the Paper Constructs, or as I like to call them, the Paper Cuts. These are Class 6 composite entities. Now, these guys are very similar to those stone gargoyles in that they are both being controlled by powerful spirits. For our next entity, let's talk about those book bats. They are class 2 floating corporeal swarmers. Unlike the candelabrum crawlers, these entities are actually being controlled by animal spirits, including bats, birds, and other small flying creatures. Okay, next up are the book centurions. They are class 6 armored composite entities. They're literally just paper constructs with an extra set of armor and a shield. Next we have the Coal Golems. They are Class 6 Caustic Composite Unstable Attractors. Basically the same as every other golem, the only difference being that it's made up of flaming coals. After that we have the Cultist Ghosts. These are Class 3 Elevated Free Roaming Full Torsoed Animating Ghosts. So all of these guys were originally members of Evo Shandor's Cult of Gozer, and because of their loyalty they were granted a bunch of magical abilities in their ghost world form, including the rare ability to shoot lightning. And to finish off this level, we have Edmund Hoover, aka The Collector, or as he likes to be called, Azadlord the Destroyer. He is a powerful, class 6, armored, elevated, secreting attractor. When he was alive, he was a rare book collector who was obsessed with an ancient Sumerian god known as Azadlord the Lost. Azadlord's job was to locate items that were not of their world and return them to where they belong. However, Azadlord became greedy and started collecting these items, and the Sumerian pantheon banished him to the ghost world. Remember that, that will be important later. So, back to Hoover. He would eventually join Evo Shandor's Cult of Gozer and become one of the top dogs there. This gave him the opportunity to communicate with beings within the ghost world, and this is how Edmund and Azadlor met. They ended up striking a deal. Edmund would grab a book known as the Gozerian Codex, a magical book that would allow Azadlor to come into our dimension. In the meantime, Azadlor would link his soul with Hoover to have somewhat of a foot in the door to our world, and so he can see what was happening on the other side. Anyway, the Gozerian Codex was somewhat hard to get to as it was being protected in the New York Public Library's Special Collection exhibit. So, Edmund met and seduced the head librarian there, Eleanor Twitty, or as she's now known as, the Grey Lady. Hoover would use her to gradually steal more and more important books and artifacts, however Eleanor eventually caught on to what he was doing and tried to cut all connections with him. This just made him angry and he killed her and another dozen people to try to cover it up. But he didn't do a very good job however, as he was quickly caught and hanged for his crimes. And throughout all of this, he never managed to collect that Gozerian Codex, so now Azadlor was not only stuck in the ghost world, but his soul was now merged with the Collector and he had no control over his body. Why is that, you ask? Well, each and every one of Shandor's top lieutenants were granted extremely powerful magical abilities when they died, as a thanks for their eternal devotion. This made Hoover way more powerful than the banished Azadlor. So, with the combined power of Gozerian magic and a Sumerian god, Azadlor was possibly the most powerful cult of Gozer member besides Evo's destructor form, but I'll get to that later. It's probably a good thing that the Sumerian god's banishing spell still worked when Hoover took over, or he would have been a real problem to deal with in the real world. Anyway, despite all that, both Hoover and Azadlor are both dead now as the Ghostbusters pretty quickly beat them with their modern technology. Okay, now let's finally get on with the museum level. Let's start with Miss Mirnik. She is a class 4, free roaming, full torso possessor. When she was alive, she was the founder of the St. Nicholas Rehabilitation Mission for Wayward Angels. 
Their mission in the public's eyes was to take the homeless, drug addicted, and prostitutes of New York and rehabilitate them. But Mirnik had ulterior motives. She would take these women and train them to um, serve more higher class clients. And once these clients became regulars of her establishment, she would blackmail every one of them and become rich in the process. However, Karma would catch up with her as one of her clients, a local gang she was blackmailing, paid a visit to St. Nicholas and killed her. After that, we have the Beauty Queen Ghosts. They are Class 3 Wandering Possessors. These entities were beauty queens when they were alive and were obsessed with staying attractive and always getting attention. But for whatever reason, they are now a severely twisted version of their former selves. And another weird thing about them is that every evil statue that you come across throughout this level is possessed by a beauty queen ghost. I have no idea why there are so many of them. Next up we have the flying skulls that can be found in the museum, island, and cemetery levels. They are class 2 corporeal floating swarmers. These guys are the same case as the book bats, except these animalistic spirits are for whatever reason drawn to human skulls, both real and prop. Now let's go back to the 1800s and look at the Union and Confederate soldier ghosts. They are a mix of class 3 and 4 full torso floating remnants. First, let me start with the Union ghosts. They were a part of a local New York Civil War unit nicknamed Thurbold's Wrongways after they got lost on the way to battle and died of exposure during one of the state's coldest winters. On the other hand, the Confederate ghosts actually made it to their fight. It is said that they were so focused and determined to win that they never even realized that they died and still continued to fight long into their afterlife. Okay, let's talk about the black slime creatures, starting with the Venom Crawler. They are Class 6 Swarmers. So remember those Candelabrum Crawlers? Well, the Venom Crawlers are those spirits that possess them. Only, at this point in the game, they don't need a medium to enter our world, so they just use those ghost world portals to walk through. The next black slime creature is the Black Slime Fiend. They are class 5 corporeal caustic secreting entities. These guys actually used to be low level gozer worshippers, now reincarnated with black slime as mindless drones with no memory of their pasts. Other than that, there's not much to say about these guys. Last black slime creature for this section is the Black Slime Ghost. They are class 5 caustic secreting floaters. Pretty much the same as the Fiends, low-level cult of Gozer members who are twisted and forever bound to serve Gozer in death. Seeing as how these are slightly more powerful than the Fiends, perhaps they were a bit higher up in that cult compared to the Fiends. And to end this level we have Cornelius Wellesley, aka the Chairman. He is a class 7, elevated, full torso, free roaming ghost. I'm actually not sure if he should be a class 7, in my opinion he's just a powerful class 4. He's really not so different from the class 3 cultist ghost, the only difference is that his magical lasers do more damage than the cultist's magical lasers. And one can argue that he's actually weaker. While every other ghost needs to be captured in order to subdue it, the chairman can be destroyed by just simply hitting his glowing eye enough. Anyway, enough of me ranting about the inconsistent CDI system, let's actually talk about his backstory. Cornelius Wellesley was one of the most financially powerful members of Shandor's cult of Gozer. In the early 1900s, he was both the chairman of a large steel mill and a member of the Natural History Museum's board of trustees. He was probably the one financing most of Shandor's projects. That's probably what granted him so much power in his afterlife, but not enough power to defeat the Ghostbusters, I guess. So that's it for the museum level, now let's head back to the Sedgwick. To start, we have a ghost that you actually can't scan in the game, the Echoes. They are Class 1 Ethereal Spirits. They are described nicely by Egon as Ghosts of Ghosts. These entities are the remnants of every ghost that manifested in this hotel, but they aren't the actual spirit, they're just a copy of them, doing whatever they were doing when they were alive. They are summoned whenever a massive amount of spiritual energy is flowing in a condensed area, and in this case, the spider witch using the power of the mandala to take over the hotel without a ghost world portal. These echoes are harmless and can't be interacted with, however, if an entity is powerful enough, they could command them to attack whoever they wanted. Which leads me to our next entity, the webbed fiend. They are class 3 full torsoed corporeal entities. They are echoes corrupted and transformed by the spider witch into doing her bidding. Other than that, not much to say about them. But let's take a break from these spider things for a sec and enter the kitchen to talk about Chef de Forest and his cook ghosts. Chef de Forest is a class 4 full torsoed anchor ghost and his subordinates are the same just class 3. Chef de Forest was a brilliant French chef who had dreams of becoming famous, however when a popular food critic came to his restaurant things didn't look so good. To avoid getting a bad review, him and his staff poisoned the reviewer's food, killing him. However, they were pretty dumb though as they accidentally poisoned themselves the following day. Their kitchen equipment would eventually be shipped to the Sedgwick Hotel at some point, leading to their eventual manifestation during the events of the game. Also, on the topic of those kitchen equipment, I have to talk about the kitchen flyers. They are class 2 corporeal floating swarmers. They are just those book bat spirits finding a new item to call home. 
Okay, back to spiders. Next up, we have the spider crawler. They are class 6 swarmers. Remember those venom crawlers? These are literally just them, except they were corrupted by the spider witch to look like, well, spiders. What else? And finally, we have the big arachnid herself, the spider witch. She is a class 6 elevated entity. When she was alive, she was a prolific serial killer whose real name was never identified by the police. She was also, of course, a Shandorian Gozer worshipper. Her emma was to lure men up to her room on the 12th floor of the Sedgwick and kill them before draining their bodies of blood and hanging them upside down from the ceiling. This may have been for some experiment on Shandor's behalf, but we don't know for sure. Anyway, thanks to her devotion of the cult, she was given powerful magical abilities and was transformed into a huge half-woman, half-spider creature. Though, of course, she would inevitably meet her end at the hands of the Ghostbusters. Okay, so this next level has only two entities that we haven't seen before. Let's begin with the Black Slime Monster. They are Class 5 Corporeal Caustic Secreting Entities. So, remember that Natural History Museum Board of Trustees that the chairman was head of? Well, these Black Slime Monsters are the reincarnated remnants of them. Having lost all connection to their previous lives, their only purpose is to defend the final Mandala node on Shandor Island. And, speaking of defending that node, that's exactly what the imprisoned juvenile Slore is for. This is a Class 7 transdimensional entity. This guy was somehow lured into our dimension by Evo and his cult, and is now being used as a simple guard dog for the final node of the Mandala. Also, side note, this guy is considered a juvenile Slore, so just imagine how big they actually get. I'm thinking the difference between Cloverfield Clover and Cloverfield Paradox Clover. And now we have made it to the final level of the game, the Central Park Cemetery. Let's not waste any time. To start, there's the Cemetery Crawlers. They are Class 2 Corporeal Swarmers. I think you could probably already guess what's up with these guys. Candelabrum Crawler Spirits finding a new home in the cemetery. After that, there's the Grave Fiend. They are Class 6 Inhabiting Entities. So, despite what you might think, these zombie-looking guys are not people returning from death to attack you. They are essentially ghosts possessing random dead bodies to give themselves a physical form. Next up is the Cultist Summoner. They are Class 3 Elevated Full Torso Free Roaming Ghosts. In life, they were low-tier leaders in Shandor's Cult of Gozer. In death, they have been granted the same powers given to the Cultist Ghosts with the added ability to summon flying skulls to their aid. And then there is the Grave Monster, a Class 6 Armored Composite Animated Entity. They're a lot tougher than your average golem, and apparently they were fueled by both Hellfire and the hatred of all things living. Next up we have the Stone Angels. These annoying little bastards are Class 6 animated floaters. They're just another form of the stone gargoyles from earlier. They're smaller and not as durable, but they're exponentially faster. Next are the Keyhead Monsters. They are Class 6 animated entities. These guys are kind of a mystery. We do know that they are extremely devoted to protecting Shandor's temple and portal to the ghost world. However, other than that, nothing is known about them. If I had to guess, I'd say that they are yet another form of Shandor's statue come to life, but I also feel like there should be more to them. And finally, the last ghost you encounter in the game is the architect himself, Evo Shandor. As a ghost, he is a class 4 full torso elevated possessor. In his destructor form, he is a class 7 caustic floating deity. I think I summed up his story pretty nicely in my Skyrim video, so I think I'm just going to show you that part here. Evo Shandor was a doctor and architect in the mid-1800s who thought that humanity was weak and would all be stronger if we just followed the great and powerful Gozer, a godlike entity from another dimension known for destroying stuff. So Shandor started a cult and performed a lot of sacrifices for Gozer, but also a lot of experiments as well. He then built an apartment building that would serve the purpose of siphoning paranormal energy to power a gate to bring Gozer into our dimension. That's of course the building we see in the first movie, and now you know how Gozer got there. He also decided to make Gozer even more powerful once she came over, so he built a hotel, a museum, a library, and an entire island, and then put a magical rune in each one of those to juice up Gozer once she got here. And to protect those locations, he used Gozerian magic to give crazy powers to his most trusted friends. And a big fish monster, but that doesn't matter. The fish monster is cool and was referenced in the first movie, but it doesn't matter to what I'm talking about right now. Anyway, Evo eventually dies, and hundreds of years later, the tower he built earlier finally gathered enough energy for Gozer to come through into our dimension. But of course, the Ghostbusters were there to put an end to it quickly. But while all of this was happening, Evo Shandor was actually a ghost just floating around somewhere, waiting for Gozer to rule the world. But when he learned that Gozer had actually failed, he quickly began using those runes I talked about earlier to bring Gozer back to life. And it took him about seven years, but it eventually worked, and he was able to regenerate Gozer. But unfortunately for the both of them, Gozer was still stuck in her weak Stay Puff form and was quickly defeated by the Ghostbusters again. Hey, 
So maybe I didn't choose such a bad destructor after all, huh? And because of that, Shandor was reasonably pissed. Imagine not only spending most of your life, but also spending your entire afterlife serving a god that was beaten by some random New Yorkers. Not once, but twice. So, he ended up using the runes to power himself up. And this time, he picked his own destructor form. You're so cute when you smile. <laughs> I just don't want any part of it, and I think they think I'm playing hard to get. <laughs> That's the only one I'm interested in. <laughs> now vowing to destroy and conquer Earth, he battles the Ghostbusters again just to be defeated when they cross the streams. Hey, it beats how he died in Ghostbusters Afterlife. We can rule the world. And that's all the entities in Ghostbusters of Video Games. Psych! No, it's not. I didn't even mention the cursed artifacts. And I know you might be saying, wait a minute, those artifacts aren't entities, they're just random objects with disturbing backstories that make them give off PK energy. And to that I say, yeah, most of them. There are a few that have some sentience, and that's enough for me to say that they are a paranormal entity. So what I'm going to do is go through all the cursed artifacts that I believe can be considered quote-unquote alive. And side note, each and every one of these is a class too. First up, we have the Toaster of Sights Unseen. In 1968, there was a powerful medium named Madame D who was on the verge of death. In her last moments, she sent out her power to the closest object she could, and for her, that was a toaster. So now, this toaster has the ability to answer any question about the future. If only it could talk. Next up is Petrelli's Mischievous Traffic Cone. Nothing is really known about the backstory of this cone, but it seems to enjoy playing pranks on unsuspecting cars. It subtly moves from place to place around the street, causing a great number of bizarre traffic accidents. After that, we have the Reluctant Reading Lamp. In 1939, novelist Arthur Houston wrote many books under this lamp. However, as he got older, his writer's block got worse and worse until he ultimately died at his desk. A part of his frustration passed on and manifested within that lamp, and now it refuses to turn on whenever something is under it. Next is Featherwell's Stocking Chair. In 1976, an aspiring ventriloquist named Nate Featherwell spent his life savings on a charm from a voodoo priestess. This charm would imbue life into any wooden object he wanted. Nate intended to use the spell on his doll, but he accidentally brought the chair he was sitting onto life. Despite this, Nate still continued to use his doll, but this just made the chair jealous and he and the doll mysteriously died in a wood chipper accident. Up next, we have the Ritual Mask of Bad Advice. So, the only thing we know about this is that in 1915, Leslie Campbell, the niece of archaeologist Gordon Campbell, received this mask as a package from her uncle. There was also a cryptic note included with it, simply saying, don't listen. Apparently she did, because soon after, she went missing and was never heard from again. After that, there's the bagged head of Azahotep. I just know I'm saying that name wrong. This head used to be attached to a larger statue of the ancient Egyptian god Azahotep. For whatever reason, the head became detached and was covered up in plastic wrap. Now it just occasionally breathes and mumbles, but sometimes it will whisper a maddening riddle that has sent multiple people to the asylum. And then we have the possessed bell-bottom jeans. So these pants are actually well known throughout the psychedelic community. They tend to show up whenever something bad happens to hippies. It first came to life during a seance on the Merry Pranksters tour bus, and throughout history they have been spotted at Woodstock, the Summer of Love, and the Altamont Speedway Free Festival. But it is kind of weird that it shows up in the Spider Witch level. Maybe that means that the new recruit is a hippie. Next is the Phantom Flush Toilet. In 1906, King Edward VII received this toilet as a gift from a Moroccan ambassador. However, this was actually an assassination attempt, as the toilet housed a Turkish demon who drowned anyone who dared sit on him. Luckily for the king, his butler used the toilet before him, causing him to promptly throw it out. The toilet has since been passed through many houses throughout the years before finally being found at the Sedgwick and collected by the Ghostbusters. Up next is the unruly beard of V. Belescu. Throughout the 20s and early 30s, Russian demonologist Vladimir Belescu performed many exorcisms throughout central Russia. Unfortunately for him, one of the demons he cast out escaped into his beard, and upon his death, it left Belescu's face. Now all it does is attach itself to random people's chins while they speak, just to mock them. However, other than that, it doesn't really do any harm. And then we have the anguished stuffed bear. Really, nothing is known about this guy other than he occasionally cries. Real interesting stuff here, guys. Next is the singing slime. Pretty self-explanatory here, it's just some sentient slime that sings barbershop. Though, something of note is that they were likely part of Shandor's experiments on the subclasses of ectoplasm. As we know from Ghostbusters 2, certain types of slime react positively to music. Next up is the whistling bust of Mausch. In the early to mid-1700s, a man named Friedrich der Mausch was a notorious scammer and a cheat. For whatever reason, a bust was carved of him, and supposedly, similar to Mausch, this statue can never look you eye to eye. After that, we have a pretty grim one. 
the stone angel head. Up until 1943, this head was attached to a larger statue in a fountain in a quiet Italian marketplace. However, during World War II, a squad of blackshirts, a group of former disgruntled soldiers, attacked a woman and her small children. One of those children would end up falling down and hitting his head against the rim of the fountain, dying instantly. At that moment, all of the cherubs on that fountain sprang to life and excreted a loud, high-pitched wailing. These statues never stopped crying and it reached the point where the fountain had to be demolished by explosives. Of the remains, a single stone angel head was recovered by the villagers and hidden within a deep well. The head finally stopped screeching the second Benito Mussolini was overthrown. However, to this day, it can still be heard softly crying. And finally, we have the ghost fruit tree. Not much to say about this, I'm not even sure if this really counts as a ghost, but basically what it is is an extremely rare plant that produces black fruits that matures within seconds before fading away in a burst of smoke. And there we have it. Every single entity in the formerly canon version of Ghostbusters the video game. Gotta be honest, this video took a lot longer to make than I was expecting, so I think I'll take a short Ghostbusters break before I make the Afterlife video. In the meantime, I do have a few video ideas I've been cooking up, so stay tuned. And of course, as always, thank you for watching. Remember to like it if you liked it, subscribe if you really liked it, and I'll see you next time.